Yeah. Um, hello and welcome to our podcast, I guess. It's a video podcast. Video podcast. From, yeah. Uh, from Manila in Philippines. Yeah. Uh, we first met when we were in Brisbane, Australia. Yes. Actually, was it Brisbane? Yes, it was Brisbane. Brisbane. Yes. Yeah, at the Z-Day event there. Um, that's where you got this shirt. And I... Um, I've got a smooth and shirt, which is quite faded like at this moment in time. Um, yeah, uh, I was presenting at Z-Day and you came along and filmed and vlogged and stuff, which was cool. Yes, um, um, that was back in 2017? 2017. 2017, 2017 yeah. 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 I, I now have sort of assigned the last few years according to you know what the Z day was yes so I remember because I spent uh, a good week and a half preparing for that Z day it was incredibly intense we were getting you know four or five hours sleep a night and just building up to busy, it yeah. Bu- yeah building up to it and uh, and it was so I was so tired and exhausted when I gave that I, presentation as you know I think leading up to it there was a few events that you held like pre every, every night we were putting something on there were pre Z day events and that sort of stuff and then yeah um, anyway it was, it was big two day event it was the biggest Z day I, I think that there has been because we had two two areas there was a main presentation and there's a workshop yes. space and that for two days so I definitely felt the difference between that event and then uh, last year's event in Frankfurt Germany which was uh, a little bit small a little bit easier to to, to actually organize oh well so. you just did a marvelous job anyway putting on that one in Australia it was uh, marvelous over two days uh, Peter Joseph coming and uh, a lot of other members from around the world uh, so it was a, a good job uh, by everyone from the Australian movement to, to put that together and uh, and a group of us from New Zealand and the Zeitgeist Movement New Zealand came over to support and, uh, and it was really good definitely felt the New Zealand presence and then when I went to Auckland uh, a few weeks later and yes. presented at uh, the, the New Zealand uh, Z Day, which we held about, I think, two or three weeks after the Australian Z Day. So, so I managed to recover a bit. Uh, yeah, you did, and you did a, yeah. a great presentation. I believe it was the Price to Zero presentation you did. Yeah. Um, which, so they ended up doing it three times at three Z Days. So, Brisbane, in uh, Auckland, and then in, in Frankfurt. And I feel like the Frankfurt one was the best I was I focused much more on giving a good presentation yeah Um, and you would have included a lot more updated information that you've accumulated throughout your period of time to to present a more yeah better presentation and then at the end of last year I went uh, PJ didn't like the audio recordings at at Frankfurt there was an issue where we mixed different channels and streams right. and stuff and, and a, a video camera with, with a delay and everything we got it mixed into the primary channel so unfortunately we couldn't use the audio from that and I had to go and re-record everything and and that's the video that you just um, saw watched. yeah I saw that yeah. uh, video you've done a really good presentation there which we can talk a little bit more in depth yeah uh, shortly so uh, yeah getting back to the uh, Z Day in Australia. It, uh, there was a number of talks uh, spread over two uh, two days. Uh, Peter Joseph, BJ, uh, Eleanor Goldfield, Jason Lord, Frank Frankie, um, Federico Castano, uh, the whole range of people. It was and it was a great amazing. turnout as well. So there was a lot of the public that came along and uh, people with some open minds and a lot of questions through the question and answer session which was really informative yeah um, I think the major talk or topic there in those question and answers was about the um, uh, universal basic income uh, yeah yeah a lot of people seem to to like the idea of U, UBI UBI yeah income or UBS universal basic services yeah which in some ways the RBE is is like a really enhanced version, version of, of, of that. that yeah um yeah be the equivalent to if it's income wise be 
equivalent of being a you know getting a million dollars a year yes you know and and but without all of the likely issues of just inflation and everything else yeah you know, like the power purchasing equivalent i guess or um or just the main thing is access abundance and having what you need to to thrive um, always available there. Excellent, yeah. And then after that, we <coughs> went to New Zealand for the Z Day. There, we had a really good turnout. Then you done another presentation, yeah. and I think we actually had a, a politician come and, and talk, and that was that got a bit fiery. Yeah, with some of the public, and uh, so it was a pretty, pretty like varied uh, kind of. Um, we we definitely yeah Z-day. had a range. It was, I love. Uh, catching up with Richard Osmondson yes uh, there. Richard yeah. Osmondson yes and he also had a talk at uh, the Australian Z Day as well yeah uh, Money Free Money Free Party mm-hmm. yeah um, and there was a yeah what did you give a presentation yeah I, I gave a presentation as well but it was just about a resource based economy and uh, what it was fundamentally about just for those people that came to the, the Z Day and didn't know much about what is the Zygos movement, what is a resource based economic system. So uh, yeah, I gave just a simple overview of, of that and uh, Yeah, for the uh, viewers I s- there is an expectation you understand what the uh, at least the resource based economy concept is or, or something in, in, in our discussions. Um, yeah. Um, but do you want to give a quick little discussion of what it is? Yeah, you, yeah, we can give a. Uh, we can see. Uh, I'll, I'll fill in anything. I, I want to hear okay, your, yes. your perspective because I know what mine is. Well, so a resource-based uh, economic model, from what I've you know researched and and, and talk about, is uh, basically a. It's like a open source system where people have access to resources without the use of of money, but also utilizing the scientific method for social concern. Um, so the resources are managed more intelligently, and uh, and the Earth's um, resources become the common heritage of all the Earth's people in a way. So it's used in a more sustainable way. Uh, totally different from how we're utilizing it now in the current uh, paradigm or the current system, monetary system, capitalism, whatever you want to call it. So in its basic forms, that's what it is. Access, abundance, you have access to resources. That's what we really need essentially for our our life. Um, uh, Those essential needs, shelter, food, water, clean air, um, and a whole bunch of other things. So, uh, and once we get past that initial stage of, I call it, basic needs in survival mode, we can focus on meaningful things in life, uh, yeah. you know, whether it's exploring or more research and development or creativity, doing our passions, um, more family time, things that are more or less stressful for us. Uh, totally different to what we have now in this current system where we're working in a stressful environment uh, a lot of diseases are coming uh, from that and you know stress and anxiety levels mental health problems it's just a we're just wasting so many resources you just, you know, you just look at mobile phone networks they, they compete yes. so that you you can only connect to one or the other and you have to pay lots of money but if they collaborated then you can connect to whichever exactly. one was, was available there um, and the, I guess the way I think of uh, the IBE is there, there's a, a big challenge ahead of us and that is that humans by default will, will level out at about 11 billion people like yeah. we've, we've already gone over peak birth rate so we're not actually producing as many people with, anymore and all the stats, everything shows, all right, 11, maybe 12 billion people, that's fine. But the question is, how do we have 11 billion people living, thriving, amazing lives within the carrying capacity of the Earth? Of the Earth, exactly. And, and how do we also be a multi-planetary species and, and everything else? So the, the resource-based economy concept, uh, the actual term itself most people go, oh, you're using resources instead of money. It's like, no, what we're doing is focusing on being able to 
to effectively utilize resources in a way that right now we, we extract stuff out, you know, process it, we use it, and we throw it away. And it's just this linear model, and we just see... It's inefficient how we're using it now. Yeah, so. we, we see nature as this this infinite source of, of resources, but in reality, it's drastically shrinking, and we, we're already going over, you know, it, well, we're... We need to Earth just to sustain us at the moment. Um, and we're going to need plenty more if we, if if we, we don't keep, change and if we keep going along this path. So, exactly. Uh, but if we go for access abundance instead of, say, ownership, then instead of everyone having to own a DVD library or you know, even vacuum cleaners and stuff, you, uh, I use the vacuum cleaner model. Yes, and, I saw that in your yeah, talk, the vacuum um, cleaner model, where well, you, can, you share the use of that, you know, so there's least production of it but you know people are using that in a more sustainable way which is what we need and you know me being a traveler I had accumulated a lot of things before I left I had a house full of like furniture and whatnot and then I sold everything and the day I sold everything I felt a lot of weight off my shoulders and then I could travel around without having to worry about my things back home and uh, and even like when you shift from one place to another it's just such a burden moving with property and things when all you really need is just access to those things exactly you know, um, hammers and drills and stuff drills are a, a great example like the standard drill gets used maybe 14 minutes in its entire lifetime and the way we've got it at the moment most people you know, have to go buy an electric drill for yes. being able to do a couple of little holes what you don't actually want to drill you want a hole in the wall and I bought a new one for my mum before I left my travels and now it's just sitting in her shed rusting away and she only used it for one time to, to drill a hole so I mean exactly yeah. but if you could easily borrow use you know share so what you'd want is you actually want an industrial grade like long lasting drill yes. that gets used by you know 50 100 plus people so instead of there being 50 drills now there's one and it will last twice as long as those 50 drills exactly now we have things that are created through planned obsolescence and people want more you know, the corporations are profit driven they need more money they need to sell more things and planned and perceived obsolescence it's yeah just, so it's, it's it's quite ludicrous actually when all you need is just the, that for its its purpose and, uh, and that's primary, primarily it. And not having this burden of property accumulating and waste at the same time. So getting back to the RBE, um, having uh, access to those resources will do away with a lot of that wastage and, yeah. and those sorts of things that um, are now predominantly in this current system that we are in. Yeah, uh, I, I did the same as you. I mean, I traveled a lot last year and, and I, I put everything into storage and I was paying a whole lot of money for a storage unit. Went back to Australia uh, when I knew I was uh, going to, to move here yes. to Manila. Uh, and, and back home in Australia, I, I went, all right, I sold everything off. Uh, I Maybe I kept two boxes of stuff, you know, like 30 terabytes of videos and footage and whatever else. Um, uh, that I couldn't some of the essentials some of the, the, the tool riddles, essentials that but, you but it was amazing just how much I got rid of exactly yeah. and uh, I the way I put it was uh, it, it's so cheap that you will pay me more yeah and, and people were they're like oh no no that's not worth two dollars here have five ten dollars yeah and, and it was worth a hundred dollars plus yeah and uh, but I felt I feel really good and, and you know removed that burden um, I did too. I felt a real burden, and I, I moved to uh, Vietnam. That's where I'm established at the moment in Vietnam, and uh, working on a few projects there. But um, having the um, access to resources there, so I moved into like an apartment which was fully furnished and everything. Like, so I didn't have to bring in my washing machine or any of those things, or even like a, a jug to to boil for a tea or whatever. It was all there to yeah. use, and so having access 
just for those resources is amazing. Then I can move on to somewhere else if I need be. So uh, I, I think a resource-based economy will work in a similar way yeah. like that where you have access to those resources and you're not having to carry them around and and this notion of ownership. Uh, yeah, I mean, I sold a, a, a washing machine in Australia. We, we don't have one. We don't even have hot water. In, right. in, in here like you know you've you've yeah, been here, yeah you've, been here. We, we go and boil the the, the jug or, you know the if we, kettle, it, we yeah. pour it into a, a bucket and you just <laughs> you know pour water over yourself and i mean we we could go and and get our hot water system installed but we're moving from here and there's other issues where like we were given a, a small fridge but we need a bigger fridge but that small fridge because it's owned by the landlord we can't we just yes. have to sit here. It's, yeah. it's wasting space, yeah. not being used by anyone, and it just sits around. And and it's because of property. Whereas if it's access abundance, and that was the the main culture, then people, oh, here's a, a fridge. Other people need a fridge. Here, here you go. Exactly. That's it. You know the access abundance um, thing. So. Yeah, so uh, getting back to the Zeitgeist Moon resource based economy and, and your, your, your talks on um, the transition. Transition, price to zero. Um, I've got a couple of questions sure, for, your, yeah. for, your, for your talk. I'll, uh, Definitely interested. I'll, I'll, I'll grab them here for you. So, what is um, the price to zero? So, the price of zero is my term for uh, a way we could transition. Uh, the idea is that if we keep business as usual, then we're going to have economic problems, energy problems, you know, environmental problems, all these crises. We mean that the price of things will go up effectively to yeah. infinity and you won't be able to afford anything or they won't be available. And, and so that's the price of infinity. Um, the, the Venus project we're talking about the, the Phoenix model like we wait until the system collapses yes. you know, it hits towards infinity and then we magically transition and so if you're looking at it, a graph you're like it goes up and then it has That's to jump right. down go, well that doesn't make much sense to me why don't we aim to making you know food water electricity transport education health you know, shoulder everything as free as possible so rather than just waiting for people to culturally go oh, I'm, I'm happy where I am in in society I'm not going to do anything and and, tip, and then then it all collapses go no here is this better system that we're building that's cheaper and free and you know um, and eventually yeah. the price gets to zero and and at least the necessities of life are free to everyone on the planet. And, yeah, exactly. People have access to those necessities of life. Exactly, and that, that's 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 an important key step. So we're building that technology. I mean, most of the technology exists, but it's not put together in the right way. So you know, it, because we've got currently that profit-oriented perspective in capitalism, there's there's not a how can we feed everyone in an automated way. How can we build the best type of buildings which don't need large amounts of air conditioning because they're built better, but they're also built without large amounts of human labor needed, like, say, our cheap housing needs. So there's, there's Even those... roads and things like that. Um, back in New Zealand, they build the roads and then they get issued uh, funding from the government. So they rip up those, those roads and then they rebuild them again using the new funding just to keep people's jobs intact. Uh, so it's, it's ludicrous how, how that's working now in the system. Whereas uh, you, you then, uh, you'd want not just a, how do we be, build good buildings, but how do we build an entire city in a way that doesn't require oil and you know, cars and transport? How do you build things that people can easily bike around and yeah. walk around in and, and that it's green and you want, what we really need right now is to maximize the amount of forested, you know, green space. Yes. We need, I, I saw a great stat, it, it was effectively, uh, we need a trillion trees. We need to, within the next 10 years, go and, and 
grow a trillion trees and, and that will be enough of a carbon sink and everything else to get us out of the the climate crisis that yes. we're in. Uh, um, where I am in Hanoi, we definitely need that. And last week it was rated the most polluted city and I'm there riding around in a motorbike. And you've got special and I've got special face mask on, mask just... on so uh, and I'm there and I'm going, oh my goodness, they, they actually need more trees here. And there's lots of space for that to happen. That they it's need just more such trees. a concrete jungle there. Like yeah, it's, it's it just, is a concrete jungle. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just uh, concrete with, without the, the tree part of the jungle. It, it's, and the population is increasing immensely at the moment there. So they're building not only up, they're building out. Yeah. Um, but I think yeah, trees need to be implemented there too. And it's something that surprised me about Manila because I spent seven months yes, in Vietnam in as Vietnam. well last year and and it was amazing that they really love their smoke. They're, they burn yes. everything, they burn the garbage, <laughs> they do all sorts. So I was there coughing, you know, I've got a little bit of asthma and, and even living out rural where the, you know, there's and rice paddy fields and all of that. I was fish. still like smoked, you know, people would just burn the garbage nearby and I couldn't breathe for it. But I went to Manila and it's it's the most densely populated city on the planet. Yes. And I expected just the smog alone to be bad. But it's far less than you would expect. Yes, I was because even very though surprised. It's, even though, you know, there is smelly jeeps and stuff and you if you when I run along the road, uh, or you know, go uh, go for a you know, 12k run still have a face mask yes. on but it's you don't need to be very far away um and, and it's fine because they've put all these little trees along the you know the road and and little just greenery bits all around the place so that soaks up that's good a lot it of soaks it. up a lot um, of it. it it does end up and in vietnam they're using motorbikes a lot with sub quality oil so that's contributing to a lot of the pollution that they have there as well as them like burning lots of garbage smoke and and they just yeah. i hate the way they just smoke a cigarette in a restaurant in an air-conditioned yeah. space and you go where is safe but yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's culture a cultural, that's, that's culture, just a cultural e thing. exactly cultural um, cultural thing um, so getting back to your yes. price to zero what are some of the systemic problems uh, just for those that are wanting to what do you mean by systemic problems in, in that's such a big there's I know. so many systemic problems we've we've got cultural issues we just yes. mentioned there there are major just um the, we've talked about resource usage and how we just you know dispose everything rather than like uh, this book here actually crazy cradle um is a great explanation of of how we should be putting the you know, like you've got a factory you take water in we should actually have the water inlet downstream of the water outlet yes and that what that forces you to do is instead of just going i'm going to take the water in use it dump it pollute it and then throw it out you're actually putting filtered more better quality water out and then the the river should get cleaner not dirtier yes um we should be treating everything like a material cycle so we've got you know we track the titanium or or you know metals or, or plastics or wood or whatever and, and say these have a cycle and you know you you build a you know whether it's a chair or a drone or you know whatever it is your cutlery once you've used it then what happens with it? Well, those materials should be able to be broken apart and, and disassembled to their component elements and then uh, you know, bits melted down or reformed into to new materials, new products. Uh, we should have infinitely reusable nylon threaded clothes. So, you know, I don't want these clothes anymore. Cool, they'll be re-threaded, done. Or, so that's the that's a, like good quality long lasting stuff or you have what I consider bio nutritional uh, stuff. so you might have clothing that's designed to last a week and then and then you you throw it on the uh, in the parklands because there's science saying please litter here because it's good for the environment yes um, 
And, and then it becomes back part of the ecosystem again. Yeah. So I guess systemic, I mean, transport's an example. You were just talking about how smelly and smoky and all of that. You could replace most of the transport with maglev trains for really long distance stuff. I mean, they can travel in an evacuated tube at, you know, over 4,000 kilometers an hour. Um, the, the main issue is, is like the G-forces on people. When yeah. You're talking, like, yeah. You could potentially go up to 8,000 kilometers an hour, but, you know, it just, there's so much of a G-force, whoa, that you But as don't, future um, as, knowledge comes to us, we can develop ways. We, we, yeah, we, we, can, can, we can do with solve that. Solve problem. So, it's about problem solving, yeah. But that would easily <coughs> let you do a lot of, of, you know, delivery long distance, you know, replace the aircraft and flights and stuff big giant project but the cost of transport once you do that is is relatively small you know it, it would be the equivalent of what we currently use to you know maybe drive a hundred kilometers and you can go you know three thousand kilometers yeah um, we we see now in manila um well i've been here for the past couple of days and it's heavily densely populated and they do have a huge traffic problem here massive massive traffic problem um, they, they're trying to be like Americans and they want the big cars and the macho-ness and everything else the ego and, and yeah and, thing. and they're very <clears throat> aggressive drivers they they don't care about others and they're just going to push in and, and if you're a pedestrian walking along and a car's coming you definitely give way to them whereas in Australia and everywhere else I know of you, you those cars give way to you um, and I see here the vans that's so crammed in with people so it's cramming everyone in like sardines could, yeah sardine tent you didn't even go on a train so no. it was a full sardine yeah so it's... there needs to be a, a more sustainable and more better way of use for transport like yeah that. And, and that comes down to city design and, yeah. and a whole bunch of other stuff and and within, uh, but a lot of it might be, let's say, you're, you've got to go get your, your groceries and whatever, and it's that, that last mile of transport. I mean, I ordered stuff off, off eBay and in Australia, it arrives and it's fine. Here, like, been waiting two and a bit months, wow. and I know that it hit the Philippines, I know it's here, but just it never arrived. It, the the wow. postage system just is bad. So and then on top of that, you you got huge import taxes. Uh, yeah, exactly. So the that last mile bit is interesting, and the way I would like to see it done is that within a a house, you would have a a you know bunch of transport ducts or whatever that yes you could have a little robotic system that that brings whatever it is that you've ordered, and so if you if you th throw your you know your clothes in the laundry, you know, there might be a little sh shoot, it goes away, it gets washed, and it goes directly back into your your cupboard. You don't have to think about that. It, it's yes. done automatically, and, and it's done in the most, you know, water and energy efficient way needed and, and whatever else, but you might be able to prioritize certain clothes to be washed faster, whatever. Uh, if you need food, then it, it you know, your fridge would automatically detect, oh, you've, you've taken out, you know, the milk or whatever, and, and it's getting low, you, he, here's new milk, and it'll automatically give you a new carton or fill up the bottle or whatever's needed. Um, and so that's, that, like, it's a really intelligent Use home system, and, it, and it, it just means that you don't have to go to the shops anymore. Because, because and this gets to that system, systems holistic systems view if you if you actually just think oh okay well how do we automate the tech checkout checks it's is would be a you know question someone might ask oh we go to the the store and, and how do we you know how do we automate no you're you're you've got to zoom right out and not to say okay i'm at the store and instead of getting someone to scan stuff i've got to scan it myself or it's yes like, RFID. No, what you actually want is those things in your house, and we the way we've solved that is by having supermarkets and, and places to buy things. But if you could instead 
order online and have it directly delivered, delivered. you now have removed an entire distribution system and replaced it with something far better, which we couldn't do before. We, no. we didn't have a way and of being able to get using that in. system now where and we're, and we're ordering we're online, even like food and Vietnam, you order the go, the grab food. So if you and want, it can come, come straight, straight to, to the you. door. You, you don't need... It's in an app. Now yeah. suddenly you, you've... You, you know, you've got an entire, you know, all these supermarkets and all these other places that, that you know, you might have it, they all have regional distribution centers and the food would just come from there. Or ideally, the food would come from vertical farms. Yes. Just, you know. Nearby. Just, just nearby. Yeah. And it would just be picked fresh, go, here's a tomato, here's an apple, whatever. Come straight to you. And this can be set up in multiple communities, multiple yeah. places. Yeah. But it, it needs a high tech, and this is this is the difference between. Uh, so talking about the transition now, I yeah. guess um, most people think, oh, I, well, if we're going to transition, yeah, let's let's. And I talk about sustainable communities, uh, but not the existing sustainable communities that most people think of, not the the hippie commune thing, because they're very high labor intense. Yeah, what we need is actually a high-tech sustainable community, an, an RBE aspiring community. And that requires you to have, uh, I guess, almost a, a research and development think tank yes. that, that is developing the, those systems and say, all right, how do we create a, you know, a home that has a transport system built into it? So even if it just goes to a, you know, to the table and and your stuff just gets put on the table automatically. Uh, I've seen a great little system where it's just like a little fire beam or, or something like that, that a, a little robot. robot, it's just got, you know, some little clasping hands, can just move things around and you can have multiple different tracks and it can be quite intelligent and you can have a whole bunch of them moving around. And sort of like our restaurants are, like some sushi restaurants have that robot that now serves the food and comes yeah. around and got the tray and it comes to you and all sorts of... Exactly. There's, and once you've got something that you, you can now say, okay, it can, can, it can hold various sized containers. And those containers, and, and, and I call this the, the Tupperware economy, um, <laughs> where instead of getting plastics and everything's wrapped and wrapped and wrapped. No, you, you get a reusable container and it, it's there. Once you've, you've taken the product out or it's automatically you know, placed for you, that, that container goes back into the system and is reused and, and if it needs to, it's washed, whatever's needed. But you, you would have, instead of bins, you just put the containers somewhere and, and it would get taken through into that distribution system. Yeah. Um, that means that you're not throwing away insane amounts of plastic. You know, you, you might mostly be using glass containers and, and you know, or really thick plastic containers, whatever is needed. Um, yeah, suddenly you don't have the, the great ocean plastic... Plastic joke, pollution you know, type of thing. Yeah, and as, as there's a few... Um, things that have come out recently where people are now using the plastic that's in oceans they're recycling it in a more better way um, in Vietnam now they're actually doing away with plastics and replacing it with bamboo um, for packaging especially yeah. for packaging supermarkets and, and that kind of thing so they're trying to go down that that way yeah um, for now uh, so let's um, can you give us a bit of a explaining about or can you explain a little bit about the, the phoenix model and the collapse to an rbe yeah so I, I sort of talked a little bit about that saying okay uh the 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 price of infinity everything gets so expensive with well, the phoenix model was everything gets so expensive civilization collapses and the the underlying assumption in that is is that right now people aren't motivated to, to change to a new system and they're not going to be until, and here's the, the, the until is, uh, the an analogy I used was, was the burning building. Yeah. So if you're, 
Yeah, so you've got that, a, yeah. You, you're in a building, um, and a we're saying, "Hey, go go across to this other building." Yeah. But there's this this plank on you know on the, between the buildings, walk, between the two buildings. You got to walk yeah. the plank, and it's somewhat dangerous. And people go, "What the hell? Like, I might fall. It's dangerous." I'm happy where I am in this building. Mm. That building has nothing to offer. Why do that? But if your building is on fire. You're, you're now in, in mortal danger yeah. if you don't move. So you're going to go to the other yeah. building. It's like the Titanic sinking, you know. Yeah, you know, you're, uh, fine. you're going to stay on the Titanic. But <laughs> if it's sinking, you're going to jump, even yeah. if it's into icy cold water. Yeah. But that's the thing. We don't want them to jump into icy cold water. <laughs> you know, we, we don't want the, the Titanic to sink. We want it to... You know, we want to go and make... I don't know... Until the Titanic sinks, I think a lot of people are trying to arrange the deck chairs on the Titanic to try yeah. and keep the Titanic going, but eventually yeah. it, it will sink. But, and, but we, uh, we actually want a new, in this analogy, I guess, the Titanic, yeah. we want a new ship that they yes. can go to. And not rearrange the deck chairs. Yeah, yeah. They, they can bring their deck chairs over to the new <laughs> ship if they really want, but they, they yeah, uh, I mean, the RBE is, uh, what, we, what we really want is to create such an amazing system. I mean, if you got food, water, and electricity, and transport, or all those necessities of life for free, I can tell you I, I want to go there. Um, yeah, so... I think a lot of people would want to go there and, you know, they'd find, um, they'd come up with new um, things to do. Their creative outlook would be a lot more open and uh, they'll do some of the passions that they could only do if they had A, money, or B, time. It, exactly. Uh, so just finishing off the building okay. analogy, instead of <coughs> saying you've got to walk this, this thin plank between the buildings and yeah. it's up 50 stories tall, instead if that plank is on the ground and it's, you know, there's a party over there, that you're going to want to go over, over to the other house. building. Yeah, yeah. yeah, let's move over to the RBE because it's, it's an enjoyable place, you know, a yeah. place to be. So, so what you were saying there are, there will be and then now this is getting into the crossing the chasm type yes. stuff is saying that there's there's different groups of people and initially where are the innovators and we want to we can imagine what it will be like and we want to go and build it and then there's the early doctors who jump on board because they just want to try something new but it's not until we develop it to a point that it actually is quite quite good and often might probably won't be called the zeitgeist movement or resource-based economy it's yeah. going to be rebranded to something else uh, but it will have hopefully grown to the point that there's you know over a hundred thousand people living within some sort of rbe society and and it's starting to spread and and then the pragmatists will come on board they're, they're the people who who want to achieve something yes. in life but I mean, like me right now, I I would like to be working on the transition full, full time, time, but I can't uh, because I have to go earn enough money to to pay rent to to, to save up yeah. because we've got a baby on the way. Yeah, we're You're, all in survival mode, and so we have to sort out those basic needs of survival. But if those were taken care of, we we would have the time to to pursue those creative things that we really want to do, all yeah. those passions, whether it be family time, recreation, travel. I'd love to do more travel and then volunteer. Yeah, uh, I did a lot of volunteering in Vietnam and uh, Cambodia and different places, helping to um, educate some of the villages and... Um, not only with English, but about like with a good outlook on life and yeah. things like that uh, that I really enjoyed. And I'm still doing a lot of that kind of uh, work uh, here. So um, we, voluntary, we, we, voluntary will be a huge thing in oh, RBE. Oh, we'll, we'll massively increase because you can. I mean, we both volunteered at Blue Sky. Yes, you know, at the, that's right. A little English center in, in Vietnam, you Vietnam. know, the reason I... Yeah, yeah, that I was one. So. And it was a beautiful location, beautiful place. Yeah. Um, and a good balance of nature and uh, doing... Um, you could do some of your work there as well. I, I was writing a, a sci-fi novel set in an RBE future. Or that's that's my current direction for, uh, for how I 
hoping to help the transition is is trying to inspire more people in a different form than than say PJ's films you know um, yeah. whilst I can do basic filmmakers I can't make a film like he does or I can't even make you know like I said documentary but I'm hoping I can write uh, a novel that will be inspiring and uh, you know got a bunch of other ideas of yeah. what to do afterwards and I'll be honest a lot of the reason why I left New Zealand was because of those systemic problems back there and, and how it is a, a developed country but there's that kind of big brother thing over you you need to get a job pay taxes all this other and it didn't give me the space or creative space I needed to do what I wanted to do so that, that yeah. was one of the reasons why I left um, New Zealand I mean it's a place where yes I was born uh, but uh, now I feel a lot more happier to be doing what I'm doing um, and having that creative space is is what's what's really um, needed. Now getting back to some more of those um, questions, yes. uh, so let's talk about the many RBE communities and how can we start those RBE? There's already a few RBE communities. Yeah. Most people don't realize this, but there's like the Katagaya project right. uh, in Peru, which I mean, they, it's a they've, bit of a that's a popular one. And yeah, yeah, it's it looks like they're doing reasonably well. It's still like, like a small sustainable community that are <laughs> just getting on there, you know, but they've got a, a like a seven and a half kilowatt. Um, water turbine like a, a vortex turbine thing uh, and they seem to uh doing some up there i've seen website updates and stuff i've never been there but i hear yeah. that it's it's pretty awesome um and there's a bunch of groups that have either been trying or are in the process of starting up uh so i was part of the, those communities which which gave it a good shot and you know we had a hundred plus thousand dollars worth of investment but unfortunately that tried to grow a little bit too fast took on 80 grand worth of debt wow. <laughs> when it brought a, a, a small organics shop and then it, it just the, the intentions were great just, it was just that you know, it, yeah all the intentions were great it just I, unfortunately didn't have quite a good decision making process thing in, in there so there's that uh, but I mean, there's the one small uh, town project, Michael Cullinger's Ubuntu right. Planet stuff. There's ASIM Pack, uh, which is trying to do more of a corporate type thing. And, and I really like the uh, Coda Corp concept that uh, you saw in um, Finland's doing, where they, they want to create uh, just these, these small, they're, they're, they're tiny houses. Right. But in a way that when you're part of that community, then, then you can access uh, anything within the community and, and those sorts of things. So there's there's a few starting, but most of the issues seems to be there's, there's just a lack of, of resources. There, there's not enough money. There's not enough things. So my aim, hopefully, is to, to be able to write the novel that I'm planning to and then get a whole bunch of hopeful uh, crowdfunding types of where people donate a, yeah. a regular monthly income and, to and the Price is Zero Fund where we can we can put money to those uh, transition projects. And, and use kind of like a revol revolving yeah, uh, it's a funding model? Revolving funding model. So, uh, well, there's, there's kind of two main parts. There's, initially, there's the development of, of something. So if you're developing a new automated food production system, then you... you kind of need grant money almost. It, yes. It's money that will be used up to develop that new system. But then when you want to spread that to, you know, yeah. to be able to feed, you know, 7 billion people or something, um, you you need to... That's where the revolving funding pool comes in. So you, we might have, say, you know, $100,000 that, that we donate to... to uh, so not that we give out as an interest free, free loan to various places that they go and build a new they start they, they, yeah. they start that um, they, they build a new food production facility or whatever it is that's needed and there might be a, a a development fee so they 
you know, we might give maybe cost ten thousand dollars to set up, Start and then might there might be two or three thousand dollars extra once. So as they're selling that food off, some of the money is going to paying off that that loan, right. and then they might pay a little bit towards that development fund, and and so we can develop new things, and then when we we get at that to a point, we we start go and, and start scaling it out again. So it's a, it's that revolving funding. Yeah. Well, the great thing model. with the revolving funding model is that if you put, say, you know, a thousand dollars in, and you you know, uh, the the system that I've been a part of, Carina, the Citizens Own Renewable Energy Network Australia, they're setting up solar PV installations. Right. So if you put enough money in to, to buy one solar PV panel in the first project, you know, f 10 years later, you've already funded you know, f four plus projects, four panels, because that money gets, you know, gets used, gets paid back, goes to another project, gets paid back, goes to another, and it keeps going along. While building, whilst, while building it whilst, up. And so you, you keep yeah. building on. And then if you people are continuously donating towards it, that f funding pool grows. And, and so it becomes this incredibly a powerful way of, of using money effectively. Um, but it, it's, that, it's limited in that it can only be used for things that will give a payback. Yes. Um, you don't need to be making a profit, you just need to be, you know, making savings and you can pay back the money from the savings that yes. you're, you're having and then then you end up with that for free. So, for, so what... And then you start the next one. Yeah, exactly. Oh, so. that's, that's awesome. Um, and so you talk a little bit about the RBE aspiring communities. Um, so can you elaborate a little bit more on... Yeah, so the, the communities themselves, they, they're going to start small, just because we, we need to, uh, to, to, to be developing those systems. We, we're not going to have, you know, even if we had $30 million, and that's my aim, is to try and get like $30 million and set up a good you know, R&D think tank type thing, but you're going to start under 150 people and you, you probably want to, to set up a few of these communities around the world, get them all talking to each other and learn, work, yes. developing on different things. Set up some systems so they can communicate yeah. and collaborate. Yeah. Exactly. And then watch, if you're looking at, say, food production, then what you want to do is, is try all of the, a, a bunch of those current systems. So we've, we've, we've got standard field, you know, um, adding extra nitrogen based uh, normal production. But we've also got vertical farming and, and you know, aquaponics and hydroponics Huge. and there's permaculture and, and there's, there's this whole variety of other ways. And, uh, and then there's automated systems for those that are a bit different where you, you might have the farm bot, which is almost like this big CNC machine that goes and, and does stuff within an area. Douglas Mellet was doing something like a cybernated farm. He was, he was trying to do the cybernated farming system, yeah. uh, but he was trying, he didn't get the funding and was trying yeah. to do just something a bit too big for what people were able to give. So he needed a, a smaller prototype first yeah. and then you can then grow from there. Um, and there's some, some great systems systems already built. That's the thing is when you go and look, I, I, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of TED Talks and other videos where people have, you know, they've already got the automated uh, harvesting robots, which you see yes. in the Zeitgeist films. And there's some great, you know, uh, uh, imaging systems for knowing exactly, uh, okay, how are your plants doing? All oh, that identifying weed. will be really um, good to use on those. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I, I like the idea that you'd have the, the, the vertical farming model mm. if you're talking about growing food and because you then have hermetically sealed sections. Uh, you could even have, uh, you, you can control the, the lighting, the, uh, the, yeah. the air quality, the, everything. You, you don't have to worry about bugs and diseases and anything else coming in and if any, anything does get in you quarantine that section and, yes. and it, it's it's 
great. So it's organic by default. Um, then and it, and it's sustainable because you you're not using like lots and lots of land. Yeah, of course it is, requires a lot of resources to set up but once it is and especially if it's done in a nice automated way then then it's producing lots of food and you don't really have to worry about it much and the the the, the part of, the interesting part of it, i guess is with these rbe communities is that you're going to need different uh solutions according to your local resources yes according to you you know the environment and weather and everything else so i mean of course you know a building based vertical farm doesn't make sense if you're under the sea or you know or, or in the in desert, desert or something yeah. um uh, so there's there's all these these different requirements that will come about and so you can't just apply a one size fits all model you have to to be able then that's why i suggest you try a bunch of different things in a bunch of different places and know what works and what doesn't and, and so we end up with a few different solutions um so there have to be an environmental analysis done on the area and yeah and, and so when you like when that. you start to spread out uh so once you've built so these IBE communities initially start and you're starting to produce excess food and electricity and, and you're probably providing some some intelligence service like people doing remote work and whatever else so right to, to so you're bringing money in you're producing an excess of goods and services and you're you're selling that off to the local uh, monetary based societies around you and as much as possible internally you're you're trying to live without money and you, you have and, to go th yeah. and building up the you, your system while you can yeah so you, you and what, what you need to do is this iterative you, know, you you build some technological systems yeah you change the culture and then you you realize that the the technology systems our in local infrastructure or whatever is needs to change and then so you need to actually go through this cycle a few times before you get to something that's nice and optimal yeah before you can start to, to spread that out. Um, there's some actual really good ev uh, evolutionary biology type um, ways this works. You, you look at, I don't know, uh, birds with longer beaks and stuff. Right. And, and yeah. so they, usually what happens is the birds will go to some island somewhere and there's a, a longer, it's just slightly longer than their beak shaped um, flower and, and they start to evolve longer beaks and then over some time there's this evolutionary race and, and then they, they end up with much longer beaks than they did but they then go fly back to the mainland and then because they've got what's now an evolutionary advantage in, in another you know, in, in the another other environment, environment. Previous one, then, then they spread. In the RBE context, what uh, versus capitalism, corporations in capitalism are all fighting. They're all competitive. Yeah. And now, a great because of example, things like perceived scarcity and yeah, the profit profit motive and all of those other things there. And and you know, so you got have patent rights and and there's there's all sorts of things where you go like, here's this great thing. Why doesn't that exist in in this other environment? Oh, because someone patented it and um, if you were to take the example of chickens these uh, those chickens that are competitive might be bigger chickens and if they're dominant they're fighting each other though and as they're fighting each other they're injuring each other now you take a, a big competitive chicken and tr they attack a small collaborative chicken the, the collaborative chickens they're all working together and individually they might not be as as powerful so uh, when you just go one versus one you see oh the big chicken just dominates but when you took talk about a group of competitive and a group of collaborative that collaborative group is much more powerful than that group of competitive um you know 
10 competitive, they're all fighting each other, and then, oh, we'll go fight the collaborative. No, the collaborative ones working together are, are far better. Yes. So that's... I, d- I saw a talk about that, um, about collaboration and, and, and competition. Alfie Coyne, he had a good talk about that. And There's a great uh, you, uh, YouTube video that I, I often... Um, survival of the fittest, but not quite. Yeah. Um, and anyway, so I, I, I hope that that would be part of that evolutionary part. So those idea communities kind of need to be isolated from, from the, in, in a way so that they can do that evolutionary process change. You kind of got to shed a lot of the, the existing ways that capitalism forces us to think, develop those RBE things, because we know that the culture is going to be very different in an, in an access abundance scenario and you know, post-scarcity society, you, you've got to think very differently and it's going to be hard. We don't even know really what it's like because we haven't been, we haven't had a chance to really live in, in that type of scenario. Uh, but once we develop those, then we can can start working out how to get other people to, to live like that as well. Um, the issue is time. I think it's there's a fixed amount of time, and it's like that saying, um, you know, one wo- woman creates a baby in, in nine months. You know, nine women create nine babies in nine months. You can't get them to make one baby in one yeah so a baby yeah. in, in one month. So. Uh, we want a bunch of RBE communities and they're all going through that process and they're going to come up with different solutions and hopefully different work together. And some may fail and some may thrive and, and there'll be a bunch of different issues. There's a big scaling issue as well uh, where once you get 100 above... Actually, once you get above 75 people, it's hard to use the standard consensus model saying, here's this, here's this <coughs> issue... What do we all want to do? And everyone has to learn what that problem is and what the possible solutions are. And then everyone talks about the, you know, how to solve that. <coughs> it's very time intensive. And once you get above that sort of 75 ish, it's hard. Once you get above 150 people, the issue is Dunbar's number. And that's saying, I know everyone in the community and at least sort of what they know. So. I know that you're good at vlogging and I'm good at web yes. development and, and so you know, we've got that and I know Cliff and Polina and all these other people and, and where their s- skills are but uh, when you're looking at 10,000 people, you, you just, it's really hard to do that. So you now need a whole bunch of different decision making systems and, and elements that need to be set up there. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, there's some great systems already around, Lumio and whatever else. but. I think within an RBE, we're going to need to, to have a fine-tuned, um, yeah, be- better setup for that. Um, let's talk about micronations uh, a little bit. Uh, yeah. Like in Europe, there, there's some, and others around the world. Yeah, now. I mean, there's there's a whole bunch of micronations in Australia and and in Europe, and uh, I mean, there's there's less than a hundred around the world. So the micronation is you've you've got a country. And then within that, a great example is the Hutt River province in Australia or Sealand. Um, it's a piece of land that someone manages to get declared as, as its own little like nation. Like a sovereign a sovereign, a sovereign state w- within that country. And in doing so, you, you now, you know, they can have their own money or, you know, postage system and whatever else. And... Uh, and it's sort of we, like the Vatican. Vatican's like a sovereign yeah, nation. Yeah, that, that's actually even the queen goes there, and she has to go in like ordinary civilian clothes. Yeah. So, using a micronation setup, you now get to have uh, that control over the, the laws and, and things, because we're going to want to be doing lots of prototyping. To the point, we're definitely going to be breaking a whole bunch of, of building laws. Uh, one of the issues with uh, Earth communities was we still had to pay people, even if we didn't want to and we wanted to get rid of money. There, there was just that minimum requirement. Yes. There's all of these laws that 
that are great within that standard country context, but but you don't want that. And you don't want to, you can't just go get another country. So a micronation is a way of, of like a prototype. Um, a place for a prototype. Yeah. Um, and then it, may, it might make it harder to, to spread some things out, but it, uh, where, you know, oh, free food, but only in here because we, you have to sell it outside of, of that micronation or something. But once people start to see what's going on, you'd hope that that, that starts to spread. And it can catch on. Yeah. Okay, so I do want to look at talking a little bit more about um, the current system, more to do with now the increase of artificial intelligence um, being utilized um, in different parts of the system. Uh, in, in social media, it's been utilized to um, what they call uh, fairness uh, for people posting up different uh, information. And, uh, and it's been used in a way that I think is from my point of view quite abusive uh so i think I, uh, it's gonna ramp up a lot more now and um there are there are going to be people that are going to be affected from creative people uh who have a lot of their monetized uh things on um, these social media platforms and a lot of them are already feeling the pinch with artificial intelligence being used by the so-called uh silicon valley big wigs um so and, what, what you're alluding to there is much more about the the f filtering algorithms that yes. are used by Facebook and YouTube and the like, uh, because there is years worth of content being uploaded every day. Um, it's it's an insane amount of stuff, and so they uh, and there is even artificial intelligence robots being used to to create new content. Yes, and pump you know, YouTube and, and like full of new content. Um, but there's a, so now you, we've got this issue of sorting through what's good and what, what is it that you want. But what we have is these social media systems that they're, they're funded by advertising. Yes. What they want is you to be looking at lots of content, even if it's not good for you. So there's, there's now this bias, intentionally or not, towards, you know, what will get you to, to look at a lot of stuff and then be able to look at lots of advertising um, and, you know, what's advertising-friendly content and whatever else. And you, you recently, no, was it you? Oh, one of my friends, yeah, they you came across some, uh, some bit of uh, social media, uh, what, we, what we call it, shadow banning, which is the term where they... If you have a page, they can basically stop your reach to your audience uh, unless you do this or unless you do that. Basically, turn the tap, tap down, right off, down to the tiniest little and drop. trickle. Yeah. Uh, so it's that kind of thing that's happening. I just wanted to talk a little bit more about that artificial intelligence and lead more into how artificial so, intelligence intelligence will be used in a RBE. Yeah. So right now. In, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a computer programmer yeah. and uh, I can, you know, most algorithms, you, you just got a bunch of maths. You, you get it down to numbers and you say, okay, yeah, how long is this? Or what, what are the statistics are, are around this? And, and then you can make some decisions. Whereas most of the AI that's being used is, is a neural network. They, they give a whole lot of data, giga, you know, hundreds of gigabytes of data saying, here's these videos, here's all of this information about watch time, when do people watch, how much, you know, what are the sections they do and don't watch, and what, what do they go and watch next, and what do they enjoy? Yes. And it, and it builds up these predictive uh, models and, and says, based on all of this information, I think that people are going to want to watch this next or that next. Um, and the the so you're, you've now got both the corporate biases and also human biases involved. And we've got these weird human biases. Yes. It's, it's crazy just how bad human brains are. Uh, when people are like, God made us, you know, like, in, in, our, in his own self-image, then God's really fucked. <laughs> I didn't mean... 
Um, and let's not make AI in our own self-image because we're going to make some really fucked up AI. Um, well, Ray Kurzweil says uh, differently, doesn't he? He says that we will become the gods when we... Can well, well, yeah, this is where the, the book Homodeus by Yuval Noah Harari is really great. He yes. talks about datarism and, and there's, there's a whole other... We should, could do another podcast just on datarism, but anyway... Um, the thing with AI, and I, I, I think I'll take the perspective of uh, what the bad AI, what, what could go wrong. So you've got super intelligent AI, and, and so this, this is Nick Bostrom's book on, on super intelligence, and, and he explains, okay, so let's, rather than the current basic, let's say we've got something that gains in, in consciousness, uses itself to... Um, it, it very quickly goes up the intelligence uh, ladder to, to being a you know, hundred million times more intelligent than all of the humans on the planet. And so, but there's three forms of it. You've got the Oracle AI, which is a, effectively a Google type thing where you, you, you can ask it questions and it'll give you yes. information. So, you know, how do I build a doomsday weapon? Uh, right. It would be a bad what thing. What do I need? To, yeah. Uh, or how do I get to an RBE? And so it tell you, can tell you that, and it can understand and predict humans in incredible uh, fashion or whatever else. But there's the uh, genie. And, and I could, yes, yes. So you've got a good genie and evil genie. And most people, you, know, you, you want to talk about the evil genie problem. So... So that is where you ask it, uh, make me paper clips. And so it uses its intelligence to make paper clips. Just paper clips. You didn't specify a number, so it decided in as many as it possibly can. And it converts all of the matter that it can get hold of into paper clips. So all the humans, all of the organic matter, the entire Earth. And then it, you know, spend, send out these drones and spaceships or whatever and go and at, at close to light speed, there is just the entire universe being converted into paper clips. So that's the e evil genie problem. And then there's the Sultan, which would be it goes and controls humanity and influences, you know, whether you, Illuminati style yes. or whatever, you, you know, yeah. whether it's dictatorial or whether it's hidden behind the scenes, it's, it's, it would still be a, yeah. a, a sultan. You've got, now, you've actually got benevolent dictator, a really good dictator that says, look, humans are, uh, we've got all these weird biases, you know, how we pursue money and resources, and we're uh, evolutionarily biased to uh, be very sensitive to lot, loss aversion, we'd prefer, for not, you know, we would go through more effort to not lose something than we could to gain twice as much of it. There's all sorts yeah. of weird things. Um, and we're in a situation where we're destroying the planet and we're over resource overshoot and everything else. Let's, t you know, we could have an AI that actually controls our resources and controls uh, a whole bunch of things in a benevolent way and, and ensures that we actually end up thriving. That serves humanities for the purposes of... of yeah. It's, it's what we need, not what we want. Because what... Uh, it, it's, it's, sorry, it's about what we, we actually yeah, need to have. But not what we... Oh, I want this, I want yes. this. Because what we want has all of that evolutionary baggage behind yeah. it. Oh, I, what I want is to eat a lot uh, or, or to, you know... Yes, like a lot or whatever, yeah. but but you can get diseases, die, you know, all sorts of things that like actually let's go and and fix things up a bit. Um, so I do see that AI has incredible potential, and I think that we are definitely heading towards that way. And the resource, uh, I, I briefly talk about the the RBE and the, the resource. Yes. Some people call it resource engine or right. the, the you know, resource distribution system. Because and this is talked about in uh, Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari. And one of the, the key reasons people think 
uh, US one event versus Russia, and, and this is the capitalism versus communism part, was actually the, the state-run uh, way that, that communism was set up was based around a small number of people getting all this information and they're trying to process it, and they're trying to make the decisions, they're trying to say, how many loaves of bread should these different stores make? Now, so that, that's, that's a limited number of processing nodes that are making these decisions. Capitalism distributed that decision-making intelligence and said, well, each of those store owners work out what they should and shouldn't do, and then they, they can adjust on a daily basis according to what they think the needs are and, and everything else. So we, that's why you would have these major long lines and not enough food in, in Russia because they weren't very good at getting the resource allocation right. But now we've got an issue, we've got such an overabundance of, of production, but it's wasted and, and not very useful. So we actually need to go, in a way, back to a centralized way, but with, in, in that the decision-making processes that aren't being run by, made by lots of different people, but they're being made by an intelligent system based on all of that data. So fast feedback loops like we've yes. got. But with what I would hope would be, say, like a fifth generation uh, distributed ledger. So distributed ledger is the, the underlying technology to, to crypto uh, and you know, Bitcoin, whatever you want, want to say. Um, but in the, the current, you know, like Bitcoin was, was first generation and incredibly energy inefficient and, and has some major problems with it and, and just can't scale either to what we need. And then there's things like Ethereum, which you might consider Gen 2, and, and then um, uh, Hashgraph would be, say, Generation 3. Um, you might consider uh, that there's some other technology you could almost consider another. But the Hashgraph is this... It has this great ability to scale and, and could be what we need almost, let's say, two more generations of, of crypto later. We could have a system where, uh, you, you know, when it comes to ordering things online or, or uh, whatever you need and say, oh, okay, that, that arrives here. How, how, where does it come from? Where is, is that picked right now? Or do you get some old stuff? Or, you know, like if you've got food in the fridge and it's getting a little bit old, then, then that is automatically allocated okay, to somewhere good. else and say, look, we've, you know, someone's doing a big cook somewhere else, you know, there's, there's a kitchen. And so it's moved over to there. All of those little things can be done in an automated way. But you you can't make the decision and, and your fridge could, could ping and say, hey, this is, this is getting old, but you need a, a, a different system that, that can actually do all of that resource yeah. routing. And so what's good about a distributed ledger type system is that anyone can access, <coughs> can access the records and say, what has been allocated, what is being, got, how is this working? And, and so you can run a little note, you can see, exactly what's going on and the it should be at least semi-transparent or fully transparent in that you should be able to see what the algorithm making those decisions is so initially you might just have someone like you know initially the, the filtering stuff you just have someone writing some code but now you, you might get to the point that you need to do forward simulation and you need to understand these, these complex patterns where it's, oh, well, we're going to have an influx of people every time for, for Christmas or whatever, and we need to, to have all this um, extra tofurkey ready yeah. or whatever it is. And, and that's, that would be <coughs> hard to predict just based on... on you know, last week's trends, but you know, ten-year trends, it would it would come up, and there's all of this sort of stuff. So now you, that's where I can consider it semi-transparent in that it would you wouldn't really know because no, it's it's hard for it to know what the 
the the exact weighting of everything was to to make that decision. But you could run simulations. Uh, you you would know what information it used and what the outcome was, and you could have an, a, a rough idea of how it made that decision. Yes. And now people, instead of talking about politics, instead of talking about, you know, oh, who do we vote for? No, how do we improve this algorithm? And how do we make algorithms that can be, a, can be culturally appropriate? So you might have a city that's completely filled with vegans and another with vegetarians and, and another with high-tech people, another with low-tech people, uh, and they've all got these cultural differences. And they're all going to want different resources in different ways. And so now you get, they'll, they'll try and optimize their local parts and then that has to still feed into the yes. global grid. Uh, and so people would, would go, okay, well, yeah, you doing a bunch of you know, computer science stuff or you probably have a whole big multidisciplinary approach. Hey, we found something and we, we, we've taken a simulation of all of the existing you know, in, um, ways that resource allocation was done. And we noticed that there's these, these edge cases. We've now been able to fix those edge cases where, oh, you had to wait 20 minutes for uh, you know, an automated taxi car to arrive and, and pick you up or uh, whatever it was. And now that's, we, we've got something that's better than this. And we can, we can run this simulation, we can show that it, it would be better based on old stuff and, and how we expect it to be. And, and you know, run all these unit tests and everything else. And, and so that would be replacing all of the resource allocation stuff and all the politics and everything else. Yeah, and I think that's the thing I was alluding to and, and, and more about the transparency, whereas now it's not very transparency in how it's AI is being used. and We could do that right now. You yeah. could select different algorithms and different filters. You should be able to do that yourself. Yeah. You should be able to say, do I, uh, oh, I'm, I just want to see... <coughs> Yeah, I, I've got I got five minutes on Facebook. Just so, show me the basics. Or, hey, I actually I want to see humorous stuff, or I want to see uh, you know uh, catch up with what people's milestone. You know, oh, how many people have babies and wedding and whatever else. You should be able to filter those things yourself rather than Facebook just automatically filtering it. Yeah. And they should, you should be able to switch it and, and show the opposite and, and say, show me the stuff you don't normally show me. Show me stuff from, you know, I've got a very, you know, left-leaning bias because of all my friends and because of all the, what I normally show interest in. Show me stuff from the other side. Yeah, and I think... And get me out of that filter bubble. And that's what I think I was talking, talking about too, was about how those, um, those AI... That, that AI technology is is used in this term they call fairness. So, what they what the big companies perceive as fair, and what information you put out there is could be different. And so yeah. your information then uh, gets censored, or you get censored from uh, talking about that information. So, I think that's what I'm alluding to. Whereas in a resource based economy, I think would welcome all sorts of collaboration. Yeah. To yeah. Um, there is one thing we're almost touching on, and I guess I'll, I'll cover it, is, okay. uh, is tolerance. Right. And there's this, Karl Popper talks about the, uh, the contradiction of, of tolerance in that you have to not tolerate the intolerant. So in talking about, you know, the filter system, what to show and what not, uh, to, there is this current rising increase in racism and you know Nazism censorship and, and, as well. And, and, coupled with and, censorship, yeah. that's coming out. Yeah. Now, often those people who are incredibly good for the, the the racist Nazi type thing, you know, they they're saying <coughs> they don't tolerate other people who aren't <coughs> Aryan race, you know, aren't, aren't white people. I have no, like, I don't, I don't notice, oh, yeah, okay, you got brown skin, I guess, what, I don't know, like, I don't care, does not make a difference, does not, to me, indicate anything about your intelligence, anything about you 
you know, it, it, maybe it, it just tells me, oh, you're from somewhere that had a bit more sun. That's all it, yeah. all it means. <clears throat> and if you were to spend time in Antarctica, you might have to take some extra vitamin D tablets because uh, you're not able to, to get as, as much vitamin D from the sunlight because it's so little there. That's uh, cod liver oil in, uh, up in the Arctic areas that was, was required for people to not in order to survive up there. That's that's it. That's, that's the only thing. But people think of it as, as a way that it's, um, it somehow affects all of these other attributes in your life. I, I call it uh, the label consciousness where... I, people think they're this label they think that they're this that they're this color they think that they're colored so they they can be played off against one another so yeah. it's and it can be played off for profit yeah uh, which is what some of the big media companies are doing now you know so they're putting articles out a lot about that kind of racism thing but it's label versus label um, and getting back to what you said yeah you, you, you're not your consciousness isn't about that just, color just don't yeah, I think a lot of it comes back to to people about who they really are, you know, what they really are, and that uh, these labels are just for my experience. It's just an experience here. We're just yeah. having, it's just an experience, and not to fall into the, the the traps of the label versus label mentality and consciousness, which is what is happening a lot now, uh, uh, currently around social media and and, and everything like that. Um, I guess. Yeah, but going to the the. The paradox of, of tolerance is that you must not tolerate yeah. being tolerant. So these racist people or whatever, they're saying, we will not tolerate you or, you know, because you're like this. And as people who are, oh, I, I will tolerate everyone, it's fine. No, if you tolerate the intolerant, then they can actually overpower that and then intolerate, and then then that intolerance becomes the default. Yeah. And this is something that we're seeing, <clears throat> uh, just looking at uh, US presidential politicians, you know, sorry, presidents, uh, you're looking at, at Obama and the tolerance ha had expanded uh, because they yes. had a, a black president. Yeah. And now Trump's come in and now you see this intolerance, this wave of racism and everything else and he's, he's fueling that and he's using it to his, his own for his own uses in, as, as well uh, and you can definitely tell that that I, I don't agree with it now I, I don't think that who the president is changes much about uh, you know how many drone strikes there are in you know Middle Eastern countries or a whole bunch of other stuff that's organised by other people but culturally that figurehead um, has an effect on the cult, uh, uh, on, on the, and so that that you you can see what's happening. And so well, people, he's the point of attention. I see he's the point of attention. Now media use him as a point of attention for the masses to 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 view that point of attention. Mm. Um, and so you, you get a lot of biases about him and things surrounding him. Where it was completely different with Obama. Yeah. So you're right, the toleration was a lot more with Obama, but now it's becoming more intolerant, so he's... He's, he's built a wall, and, and there's a great article I just read the other day that the Mexicans are stealing the wall. Yes, I saw yeah. that too. So. Yeah, they're, they're stealing the, the concertina wire from the wall that already exists. I, and some um, are building swings between each other in like you've got American on this side on, on a seesaw and you've got the, the Mexican on the other side on the seesaw. So it's a, yeah, it's cra really crazy stuff. Uh, so it's not Mer Mexicans are going to pay for the wall or build the wall. No, they're stealing the wall because <laughs> they need the protection themselves around their own yeah. buildings. Yeah. Interest, like, it's yeah. interesting. It's interesting, yeah. But... Uh, going back to the filtering, there will be these interesting philosophical dilemmas. Okay, who do you filter out and who do you, you suppress? Because if you, in an RBE, you can't actually just go, we accept everyone. We still, we want tolerance to be the default. And so we actually may have to censor the intolerant. And there's this other thought, um, thoughts around... Uh, so violence 
And so how, how nonviolent is it? So if you're, if you're there looking out at your know, village and or, you know, you're looking over all of these uh, apartments and you see that someone's being domestic, uh, domestic abuse, they're, they're being, you know, the partner's bashing up the, the wife standard scenario it happens a lot unfortunately and my girlfriend uh, her previous partner there was so a lot of them of that yeah yeah so should you intervene because if you intervene you are going to have to use violence in a way or force at least to try and and suppress that. suppress that yeah. but that's using force and and the the answer is, well, yes, you're reducing the amount of violence there is. And we want, in an RBE, violence to head towards zero. It's not going to get completely to zero, but it's going to drop yeah. dramatically when we don't have all of these reasons that we're fighting it. We're not in a zero-sum game where I have Competition to... Competition is um, self-interest will become social interest. So these, these yeah. those things that are... yeah. So there's, these are the interesting things that we're going to have to grapple with. And we've, we've got all of these yeah. other new problems that we're going to have to deal with in an RBE. It's, it's not going to be easy. But by default, you know, we, we won't need massive police and military and, and everything else. You know, was it, possession is nine-tenths of the law? Well, yeah. that means that nine-tenths of the law can disappear yeah. because... Exactly. It's, it's yeah. And, okay, if, if someone, let's say I, I get a worm in my brain or I have a lesion or whatever goes on, and I get very violent, I would want someone to suppress, you know, to taser yeah. me, whatever, to sedate me, to go and, you know, fix me up. Find the problem. Find the problem yeah. and, uh, and, and fix so that I'm not going to be violent. I don't want to be violent to others. And if I'm being violent for whatever reason, then you know, it, it might just be a, a, an emotional reaction because of um, of a whole bunch of different. You know, I'm really tired, and and then I was unexp- and and then I was embarrassed, and then and then I t- stubbed my toe, and and then so, so I thought someone punched you know punched me in the arm, but there was like, hey, jolly good, and and I I'd been drugged or whatever, and suddenly I I got violent. Like no, suppress that person, you know, so that they then can can reduce that violence uh, and this gets to an interesting point and there's a great TED talk on treating violence like a contagious disease yeah so when you think okay well if I'm violent then then other people might be violent and, and you start applying this on a large scale you say you, you actually start to see these crazy trends where it's like oh 9-11 well if you look at, uh, go back through history, you see that Russia tried to invade Afghanistan. America put you know, billions of dollars into Afghanistan through Pakistan. So they fully armed Afghanistan and, and tr- got, uh, you know, CIA trained. When they say, um, uh, you know, CIA trained uh, Taliban that they're talking about the fact that they armed up the um, the Afghani people to fight against Russia so of course they didn't even really know that they were yeah. being you know helped by America so much they thought it was it was half America and half Saudi Arabia in income mostly uh, that was funding this but that was from a violence perspective you were you were adding a whole lot of violence to that and then there's some splashback and it hits america in the form of 9-11 and and then america goes and tries to to stop and stop and stop but what they're doing is they're spreading more violence they're if this is an this is an open oozing wound with you know and, and they're just spreading it and all there's been the a place. lot of violence over the history yeah of, um, from the wars to all sorts Israel and um, uh, Palestine uh, all of those that conflict 
World War Two. After World War Two, they went, and went, oh, here, Jews, we feel sorry for you. Here's a part of... And, and then here, this other country with the with existing people, we're going to allocate some of it to you. And then that allocation has increased. And, and, and then there was the Vietnam invading. War and... All of that. And if we worked collaboratively together... Uh, you, you could, if you took the trillion dollars a year that the US put into military defense and nuclear and weapons and everything else. And countries that are using big funds for war yeah. and defense. Yeah. If you put that kind of, the US could have gone and created so much renewable energy that they would be able to export energy to the Middle East. You know, like to I mean, solve they, a lot of the problems. I mean, they, they don't really need it. They've got plenty of oil, but that you, you know, like, you, you wouldn't have the fight over the, the remaining oil supplies because you would have such a vast amount of renewable energy. So it, that's a mindset change. Yeah, uh, we've got the resources, and we've already hit global peak oil. Uh, there's an interesting point about the global financial crisis. You know, 20, uh, 2008 GFC. It's believed that six months earlier, we actually hit global peak oil. Maybe it was considered a year. And so that all those subprime mortgages, the question is, why couldn't people suddenly not be paying them off anymore? Well, it's because the price of things went up. And the price of things went up because the price of oil went up. And, and that's the bit that most people yeah. miss. They just see that people stopped paying, but they don't say, why did people stop paying? For, for those, uh, you know, yes, there were bad deals, but they would have been fine until this thing happened. Looking back at the root causes there, um, creating uh, a, a lot of those problems in the global financial crisis, I've, I've been looking at some of the patterns and some others believe there could be another one on the cards coming. Yeah, definitely capitalism has, has these, these waves, these oscillation waves, so um, it could be another financial crisis like before, but could also be, in hi be hyperinflation. I mean, the US is going to do what they can to stop hyperinflation. But with someone like Trump on, you know, in control and with Brexit and all these other things, there's this disintegration that stopped the ability for the rallying that could occur that would might prevent some of it. Now, if the US dollar goes through hyperinflation and goes from uh, right now, Australian to US dollar, that's like 70 cents to the dollar. If suddenly the, the US dollar, one dollar is, now it's a thousand US dollars to get the same purchasing power. Mm. You know, it goes up by a thousand fold. During hyperinflation, that would happen within a month. And then there would be three more months and it might be to up to 10,000 dollars. Because so much of the rest of the world bases themselves on the US dollar, this would just cause major economic shocks. It would, yeah. Um, and that's where, you know, some people who are doing well for themselves, they don't just put money and in, in savings in, in one in, basket. Into, a, into a bank. They buy things like gold and silver yeah. and what else with the hope that if something like that happens, then say they've gold or, 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 or other resources will still be worth the same amount. It won't suddenly be worthless. You know, you, you still want that. But you know, the, the important thing is that you've got enough you know, good cutlery and cooking. You, know, like you don't have to suddenly go buy lots of things because uh, you won't be able to afford anything you'd be able to afford to, to dry it so um, yeah that that's a potential that that if a bunch of friends of mine who are much more up on the uh, finance side talk about but either way whether it's inflation or deflation or, or just collapse at uh, of, a, of like the GFC kind, not. It, I still don't think we're close to a full global, uh, global, global, global collapse. collapse. Yeah. I don't think it's just going to collapse, and that's the other thing. We're not just suddenly go. Oh, there's no, there's no. Everything just stops. It's like no, it's going to be that slow collapse that happens where you've just got the system that is so hungry mm. for wanting for more, like, wanting more. So. 
that goes back to the Phoenix model we we're talking about, saying, well, okay, let's let's pretend we're going to try yeah. rising out of the ashes of capitalism. Well, what are you going to do? Let's say you, uh, we have this big giant tank of, of petrol so that we we can run these these systems, and we we've got the, these other resources. Capitalism will do what it can to extract that from you, even if it means it can only last an extra day. Mm. It will go and, and bring the military in and, and, and destroy you and, and get those resources. Uh, and you, you're not going to have, have that. Whereas kind of the price of zero transition where it doesn't need it anymore. And I, I think the more that the system squeezes people, people uh, are going to respond. And uh, we've seen that now, uh, um, like in Hong Kong with the... A lot of protests happening there, and then you've got. And that's just uh, cultural pressure. That's yeah. that's not resource no, yeah. issues. And then there's the ones back in like New Zealand, where we've got uh, a place called Ihumatau, which is some sacred land that's uh, been brought up by the corporate autocracy. They want to buy it up, and mm-hmm. they're doing underhanded deals and things. And then you've got the other ones in Hawaii. So there's little um, things like that that people are feeling pressured, and they're try- they're reacting. Uh, could be a global reaction if, if, if things get squeezed a bit more and uh, I don't know what the outcome will be. So the, this kind of brings to Arab Spring uprising and uh, there was a, a bunch of countries that all had a, a revolution. Now, Dictator's Handbook and, and a bunch of other things um, show what, what actually happens is that you've got the, the military mm. and, and they're part of the keys of, of power. Like, you've, if you're running a country, then you've got a, 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 a few people that you want to, to give as, as much resources and attention to as you can. You're effectively whether you're bribing or, or you know, providing to, to those keys of power. So the military, the people running the, the treasury and, and that sort of thing. Whereas education doesn't matter nearly as much. And no. Especially within, this is more uh, focused within a, a dictatorship. So it's, it's more visible, but it still happens within democracy. Uh, and that's why we get weird taxation rules and everything else. Uh, but there's this great formula that's civil unrest mixed with a lack of food. If you are bad at running a country to the point that people are hungry, that's when you end up getting an actual revolution, revolution. and you, you revolt. You, yeah, a revolt. So um or evolution. Yeah. I actually it's just revolution. You usually <laughs> okay. it's just a new person in power and, and the military or and, and other people let someone else take take the reins um, and hope that and usually try and ensure that the right person comes into power that that the will, right face comes that in. will help them and, and you know benefit them so yeah we we have a lot of activists who want to have a this revolution and go oh we'll, we'll just go if if these people were making the, the bad decisions and they're in power, we'll go in and you know, replace them. Take them out. The but yeah. the rules for rulers states that, uh, you know, you want those keys to the kingdom and you want to re- minimize as many keys as there are. So these, these key influential people um, and that, that process means that, and, and if you can't, keep them satisfied then they will replace you mm. and there's a zero rule which is that if you have no power you can't change anything the, the issue is that being on the throne and this is the the sentence uh, quote about absolute power corrupts absolutely yes it's because you're put in that position of power in order to keep that power you need to appease these these people and and by doing that, you're, oh, I've got to appease the treasury and, and you know, the, the people, if it's a voting system, the people who vote for me. Or 
you know, if it's a dictatorship and the people who just just keep it going. Um, yeah, the, that's where I think the evolution to maybe benevolent dictatorship of an AI um, or simply a better resource distribution algorithm. Like, I don't know the full best no. answer to to the the rules for rulers and and this is something i want more people to talk about and say well, how, how do we deal with this how how if, if this is the case then what is the best system to have i think looking at um and, and i'm going to talk a little bit more about the ai looking at the use of ai it it looks like we could be going towards that kind of benevolent type ai super ruler where people instead of who have these uh, connections with uh, gods of such will be more like i think um praising a, a super intelligent ai i mean people are doing that now you go into a, a train and people are just locked in and gridded into their phone and uh locked into the internet because the internet's this well central pillar of society now um yeah i think the ai that would that would be integrated there or that would be uh, so-called looked upon as a could could be looked upon as a god of such uh, having all knowledge having all access to things and us integrating with it but my fear of it being used in a monetary based system not in a transparent way is, is that yeah. that's that's where it's and, and that's where a lot of things get worrying is when you apply the profit motive in competition yeah. and, and like the current system you know, the way I talk about it were you you've got uh, pure science like E equals MC squared and working that out now the application of that can be going and learning the age of the, the sun and how the stars work and, and all sorts of and you get nuclear physics and and you could go we could have nuclear fusion mm. but instead we went for nuclear fission we went for bombs we went for nuclear bombs we now have the ability to nuke all of the planet many times over and we, we still have 30,000 nukes on the planet um, you know it's it, yeah maybe it's not 40,000 like we had uh, a few decades ago but it's and still now, too now much technology it's going to be even more yeah. and now we're developing new systems new ways where we you know they can have super viruses and, and, and bacterial agents and then we'll have nanotechnology uh, issues and then once we start integrating with computers and we can have um, we, we can have computer viruses that can affect people and you know, there's there's all of these new ways AI that robotic can, police. Uh, uh, yeah, so there's there's all of these other ways that things can go wrong, but uh, but you can't just say, oh, genetic engineering, it's bad. No genetic engineering. You're like, well, uh, no. I mean, genetic engineering could can ele elevate people out of the current, you know, uh, evolution. We can shed that evolutionary baggage that that. Uh, stops us being the best version of ourselves um, but then you can go so f you, you can potentially go too far or it can definitely be used in malicious ways and it being abused in that, in abused and, and that's and it's, the issue is that in our current society we tend towards the abuse yeah but we don't have to and, and that's what I think is so great with the RBE. And that's where I think if we want to get to a type one, to a type two civilization, um, so this is the Kardashev scale. And uh, so type one civilization is, uh, is a civilization that's, that's properly utilizing all the resources of the planet. Type two is, is of the solar system and type three is of the galaxy. Yeah. Type four would be of the universe. Um, now we're about about type point seven. Yeah, something like we're still yeah. in the zero civilization at this stage. And, and, and there's the suggestions that it's probably very hard to become a type two civilization mm. because you know we've we've evolved from 
uh, you know, there was a thousand humans that, that survived coming out of Africa as the ice age came through. And, and so we had to do this long trip. And, you know, being able to survive multiple well, ice ages and everything else, we would have you know, major hunger and scarcity. And, and, but at the same time, we also evolved in places that there was lots of food that was, say, rich in, in, you know, vitamin C. Now, cats and dogs and other animals can create their own vitamin C from the food that they eat. The food that we eat, you know, meat or rice or, you know, uh, or vegetarian food, could, we could be able to create vitamin C from that, but there's some genetic bits that got broken. And we didn't have evolutionary pressure that killed those people off because we're all eating a lot of vitamin C back as a you know, hunter-gatherer or yeah. you know, hominid, early hominid species. So there's a lot of these weird little things where we could be much better and could be um, not... Like, my girlfriend's pregnant and she's got to take calcium supplements in the morning Right. And you need to have vitamin C with that because you need vitamin C and calcium together to absorb it properly. But as you get older, you don't absorb the calcium as well. Later on, in, uh, later in the at night, she has the iron supplements and needs to make sure that she's gone out during the day to get vitamin D because you need vitamin D to better absorb iron. But you can't have the calcium supplement and the iron supplement at the same time because they then clash. Kind of absorb one they, they, they don't, they, yeah. you know, the calcium prevents the absorption of the iron. And this is just all this weird evolutionary baggage that we've accumulated. And, and so the idea of like multivitamin, one multivitamin that fixes you, no, you can't actually do that. When you look at them, they, they don't work very effectively and just end up with very expensive pee because you're peeing out most <laughs> of the unused vitamins. Um, so I'd like to see, definitely would see, a lot of that fixed up and you know I've got bad knees and right. you know girlfriend's you know, got potential congenital heart defect and um, there's so many different things that we we could fix and, and that should just be it is, I'm expecting in 50 years time to be standard that you, you just you know, like I have an injection and a retrovirus goes and rewrites your DNA or you're just born having had that already fixed up and, and it's just no longer oh, now they've got AI that can detect your heart signature of your heart so it'll know who's who that is associated to like so instead of right. reading your name and that you'll it'll look at your heart so you can see your heart oh that's Michael that's Wiri that's wow I mean I've, I've got a, a heart rate monitor built into my my watch and that works well um, right. and, and so it just, just reads, reads my heart rate it, and it you know, so tells me So we've got all the holdables, now we've got wearables. Wear, and wear, yeah. yeah. next stage will be insertables. So, yeah. uh, I think that's... Uh, so I take this out when I go, there's a, when I go running, it's got GPS and everything built in. But, yeah, in 50 years time, having a wristwatch will be... Like more powerful than all the computers I within a few kilometers of here. Oh, watch yeah. in 50 years will be primitive. It'll be, well, no, I think it would either be so powerful yeah, okay, yeah, that much electronics, sure, yeah. or it would be, if I wore this wristwatch, it would be so primitive. <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah. one of those auto wind up, yeah, watches. So, so, so you, are there any future plans with what you're doing around RBE um, transition? So, like most of us psychiatrists, we're trying to do what we can within the monetary system, but to optimize our life around trying to bring yeah. about the transition Social and everything change. else, and, and that change. So, uh, right now, I'm in, in just trying to to get my savings back. A big lot of traveling last year, and and I blew through my savings, went into credit card debt, and then and at the start of this year, I sold everything off. Moved here to Manila to be with my girlfriend, and, and now we've got a baby on the way. And I'm just trying to get some savings back up. Building your base. Building, yeah, building the base, settling down a little bit. And then the aim is that next year, hopefully, our, our little baby boy, Xavier, you know, will be born in, in January. And 
I want to spend three plus months of work right. helping raise him, but also working on my novel. Great. So I've got. Uh, What's your novel about? Like new- so it it's currently called uh, the Book of New Eden, Eli's story. Um, internally, I call it Book Fourteen of New Eden. So it's it's explainable. Anyway, um, it's set fifty years in the future in an RBE. Sorry, in our Abbey society, except it starts with the protagonist, Eli, right. living in one of the last remaining monetary cities. It's a bit like North Korea. It's, it's a right. full lockdown dictatorship. They, but they actually believe that they're in a... Kind of like a post-apocalyptic Hunger, Hunger Games society. Type. Well, they, they think that they're in a post-apocalyptic right. world where... Because okay. the city to the north of them was mute. Um, and but actually, most of the parents know what went on. Kind of a dystopia. But they just go with it, yeah. and and there's a very controlling um, mayor uh, of, of the city, and and he's just he actually uses a whole bunch of advanced uh, technologies that he's got from the RBE to to control people. So you know, neural implants in the brain, and yeah. he can he can control other Those people, and he he has. Yeah. You know, like I call them the red eyes that, you know, people who go around and they, they, they have to kill someone every day. Right. That's... The that quota? Is, they get a quota? It, it's a quota. They, they have to kill someone every day. Right. That's it. Um, it's like this, this urge. Almost. <laughs> Sounds so, really interesting. So, so there's, there's a whole bunch of little religious parts. It's a movie come from it too, maybe. Potentially. So Eli escapes, gets... You know, he just manages to run. Like... 30 days and hundreds of kilometers later, he, he ends up um, getting to to the RBE and, and yeah, there's this maglev train thing that's going past and what the hell is going on? And then... Paradise. Uh, and, yeah. Well, actually, he, he dies, he nearly dies of radiation poisoning. And, oh, and, right. and, you know, there's a radiation alert that gets triggered into people, you know, send some drones and, and give him some emergency injections. He gets taken to hospital and... You know, a week later he wakes up and they're, they're flushing his system with you know, nanobots and, and turned up right. his metabolism and then they're like, hey, do you want to be upgraded to a, this advanced human? And all of, he's freaking out going, what the what hell? The and hell? I, what's going on? And I thought there was aliens maybe or uh, what hell, I don't know how, who, what? What plan is this? Was, and, and how do I afford it all? I don't understand. And, and so he's got to learn how to live within an RBE. That's awesome. Yeah. So I, I talk about the Tao of RBE, the, the main right. rules, you know, about uh, being focused on um, uh, responsibility. Right. So, so it's a, as from a, a personal perspective, you go, well, if you're getting rid of money, money is our way that we, you, we sort of... Yeah, you know, exchange. We, we exchange. But we've, we've got this, like credit tally system that we've got in our head and we go, hey, how are you doing? Well, you could use a, uh, a bunch of different ways and, and one is Wolfie or uh, it's, uh, there's the Black Mirror episode, um, Swan Dive, I think, where it's, it's all about uh, how well you like others and right. it's just this rating system. Oh, I'll give you five stars. Right. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm down to three stars. Not kind of um, the rating system that China uses. No. A bit like Sesame Credit, yeah. um, which is, is worrying as well. Um, oh, you're, you're around people who, who say bad things about yeah. China. Oh, we, you're, lower, you're, you're no longer you're able to ride yeah. the bus. Yeah, you know? exactly. No, what, what, what you want is, is just a responsibility-based system and, and I say yeah. you're responsible to the systems that support you. So the ecosystem, yeah. the, uh, the environment, everything else, the, the technical systems, the, the, you know, whether it's computers and the internet right. and everything else, and the social systems. Yes. But you're also you're responsible in a way, that you're also responsible that it should evolve and change and get better. Um, and you're integrating and you, with those systems too. Yeah, and they're all... So you, you can pay that responsibility off by... You can just help a little late old lady cross the street or hold her, you know, her bags or whatever, but hang on, that's helping a little lady. And maybe she's got to go up the stairs, so you help her up the stairs. You're like, well, if you're the person who went and invented the elevator, now you've just helped 
millions of little old ladies up the stairs. Uh, and if you work out how to have solar technology to power it, well, now you save the environment. And, and if, you, if you instead have you know, the distribution systems built into the house, then you know, you've now stopped people having to go to the shops at all and, and deal with that. Um, so these are different ways where you're, it's, suddenly you've got a different focus in, in that engineering and that, that development. It's actually really fun. Yeah. Like when we're talking about uh, technological unemployment and saying robots will, will take over our jobs, jobs, we yeah. want that. We don't want to do these yeah. boring menial tasks and that frees us from, exactly. and, and lets us do more, and, yeah. more amazing things. So not having to think about uh, cooking or having to think about washing my clothes or having to go and catch food or, you know, deal with that means that I can focus on, on programming or making art or your creative you know, help uniqueness and, or, your, or yeah. going and working out how we get people to Mars. You know, yeah. it, that's important. So we, that problem that is, solving. It's great. Yeah. Now, most people go, well, if you get rid of money, how do you motivate people? Now, we, we should know. And we talked a lot about that, yeah. Yeah, that it's, you actually, money is an extrinsic motivator. Yeah. You're doing it because you, you need it. it it's, yeah. it's, now, intrinsic motivation is much more powerful, but it's powerful for the, um, th those creative tasks. So, as a as someone who wants to develop systems, I will go and you know, oh, you know, the in, inventing the elevator or you know, developing technical, you know, computer systems, whatever it is, is actually really rewarding. You're in the flow. You're you're solving problems. Contributing. You contribute, and you've got those those three main things of autonomy, mastery, and purpose. You know, autonomy, I get control of it. I get to choose what it is I'm working on, how, when I'm working on it, who I'm working it with, all of that. Mastery is, is I'm getting better at my skill and, and I'm working on and developing my craft. And purpose is you're doing something that really matters. It's, it's helping humanity. So, um, yeah, that's, that's important. And uh, that's where the responsibility Part comes in, and I think that's that's the main part of the tower of, of RBE, uh, and then there's there's a whole bunch of other things that come yeah, along. Yeah. So, trying to put that into my novel in a way that it's exciting, but it's still teaching and, and doing that, and I want to. I've got all these other ideas put, where put some pieces. Yeah, yeah, like different languages, and it's more emoticon based, and wow, awesome. a whole bunch of other stuff. Well, uh, keep us updated about how that goes, and uh, yeah get a launch for it when it's published and um, yeah yeah it definitely going to take me probably another six months to to develop uh, and, and get it to the point that it you know you can start putting it out there and and then hopefully uh very quickly so aim is develop the novel go for a big t you know book tour around the world you know us you um europe that sort Talks. of thing and, and try and get people to actually start donating money towards the, the price of zero fund we're talking yeah. about. So that revolving funding model, revolving funding model. that means yeah, that we can, can start, start getting the, those of our communities happening. Be yeah. fantastic. Yeah. So inspire Good people, plan. get some resources, let's go build it. So let's build yeah, the got the book, which is um, going to sort of give them a bit of insight into a possible transition to... Yeah. Um, from a non-fiction point of view, yeah, uh, and then applying that to um, fund some of the starting points of uh, a resource-based economy. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. I think we're out of time, but uh, I, I next time I'd love to, to talk you, more about your story and, yeah, and just us in general and everything else. Yeah. 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 I know you. Uh, I really wanted to talk a lot about what the work you you've done, and uh, you covered a lot because you, yeah. you went over Thank to you. Germany and Australia, and you've done a few talks. So it's good that we could talk a bit more in depth about your Price to Zero talk. And Thank you very much. Things like that, and, and yeah. other things that are currently going on. And uh, thanks for the talk. It's been awesome. Cheers. Yeah. Yeah.